All right, so welcome back um, to this uh, somewhat brief, I think, uh, part B of lecture uh, 11. Um, <clears throat> so in this, in this part, we're going to do two things. Um, first, we're going to solve the, uh, the full state feedback problem, the H2 full state feedback. H2 and full state feedback. And we will then relate it, uh, the, that full state feedback problem, to something which may be familiar or may not be familiar, but is, uh, is widely uh, familiar in the controls community, which is the least quadratic regulator problem. I'll show that the least quadratic regulator problem is actually just a, a special case of H2 full state feedback. <clears throat> right, so um, let's look at the problem, first of all, formulate the H2 full state feedback problem. Uh, it's very similar to the H infinity full state feedback problem with the uh, one minor exception, oh, well, not minor, a major exception, okay. But uh, one, the, one exception that uh, there's no D11 term. Right? So if we uh, formulate our, our control problem here, we still have regulated output, exogenous input. Uh, our Sensed output is now, uh, of course, uh, the full state, as we expect. That's y here. y is just the full state. Uh, the exogenous input, or the uh, regulated output, z, is uh, c1 times x, right, is normal. Uh, there, plus d12 times u, right, this multiplies u, this multiplies w. Um, but we don't, of course, allow a direct feed-through term, d11. Right. And as we, we talked about, right, that's because <laughs> if you have a D11 term, your H2 norm is infinity, right? And so obviously we can't minimize infinity, so, right, we, we, ju we just can't consider that case. Right? Uh, we uh, then in interconnect it through a, a controller. The controller doesn't have any dynamics, right? It just takes this state X of T and uh, uses that to form U of T which is equal to k x of t. And that gets fed back through the system here, um, which uh, is, is governed, of course, by these state space equations. All right, so um, we can formulate the, uh, the closed loop system uh, relatively easily. Uh, the closed loop system, uh, linear fractional transformation. Uh, well, that's just, uh, uh, what's the uh, a plus uh, b K right there. Uh, it's a four, four, set, uh, four matrix representation, right? Because uh, it's just mapped from W to Z. <clears throat> right. uh, and then, okay, what, do we, what else do we have here? Um, <clears throat> so the inputs, of course, are just uh, B1, right? Uh, which is, is um, you, this term right here. <clears throat> Uh, the uh, the outputs uh, right are uh, c1 right times the state, um, but also we've got uh, we've got to we've got to add right c1 plus d1 to u right multiplied by u, uh, so we've we've eliminated u right so u is just uh, k x of t right right there, uh, so we've got uh, d1 to K term there, and we've got zero here because we don't allow direct feed through terms. D11 equals zero. All right. So there's our closed loop uh, linear fractional transformation. Right. Uh, it's uh, B2 right there. <clears throat> so the, the 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 goal then, right, is to minimize the H infinity H2 norm of this uh, of this system. So let's, uh, oh, I should probably write it again, uh, the closed loop system, A plus B two K, C one plus D one two K, right, uh, B one zero, right. So if we apply the LMI on the, the previous slide in, in the previous lecture, part A, or part A of this lecture, that is, um, then we get, of course, uh, something that looks like a plus b two k times p. Uh, I think we got the, the transpose going there. 
Um, actually, we, we're using the dual formulation here, so we, we don't. Uh, and then plus uh, the alternative, the transpose, same thing, transpose. And then we also have a, a, a C1 uh, uh, plus D12K term times P as well. Although actually we're using X here, so I guess we should use X. All right. And then you just do a variable substitution here for Z and uh, an X shows up there. So you get B2 times uh, Z. And likewise, you get D12 times Z. There's another variable substitution there. All right. And so if we just plug those, uh, that variable substitution into the LMI from the previous slide, well, we get something like this, right? which, is, uh, which is not bad, right? Uh, the, the first inequality is, uh, is linear in, uh, in X and Z in our variables, so that's, that's okay. But of course, uh, the second inequality is not, right? It's got an X inverse term in it. Um, and of course, it's quadratic in these variables. So not, not linear yet. Clearly though, however, uh, this is in the form, this term here is in the form of something like the sure complement. So if you move gamma over to the other side, right, you get gamma squared minus that. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty clear that that's, uh, you can apply the sure complement to this formulation to get something which is linear, right? So that's what we do on the next slide, right? Um, we actually apply the sure complement to the original uh, LMI just to get a dilated version of the H2 LMI, like we did for the KYP lemma. We just applied the sure complement. We get a dilated version, uh, where now we've got uh, uh, we've got a larger LMI here, but an LMI which is linear in our decision variables. All right. So we've now applied the KYP lemma. We have an LMI linear in our decision variables, and now we'll just uh, do our variable substitution. Although this is actually the primal LMI, so actually we're going to need the dual one. All right, and we'll just plug in uh, A plus B2K here, and uh, C1 plus D12K here. All right, and then we'll do a variable substitution and, and, and be done with it. Right. Okay, so how does that work? Uh, so here we go. Um, we, uh, we do the, the variable substitution. We, this is actually now the dual version, right? So we, actually, I didn't give a dilated version of the dual H2 LMI, which I probably should have done, but oh well. Hopefully you can figure it out what that is uh, by multiplying, uh, by multiplying right, these, these terms by X inverse, right? Identity. And you get the dual version of the, of the, the same version, right? So, except now, of course, uh, that the x invert, the new dual variable shows up here, right? That's, that's, that's the main difference. And also, of course, it, it pops out of here, right? Uh, so that, that's also an issue. Right? Uh, so then we get, right, a, an LMI, again, doing our variable substitution trick, right? So that uh, z equals uh, kp, right? Uh, and that shows up here as well. And it shows up four places, actually. It also shows up here and shows up here, right? And you can just see that by applying that dual transformation um, X inverse uh, or P inverse, depending on what you choose, X inverse identity to the, uh, uh, apply that to the, uh, the dilated KYP, or dilated H2 LMI. in both terms in the, the dilated H2 LMI. So, okay, we've got, a, we've got now a, uh, a, a, an LMI for um, H2, to minimize the H2 norm of the closed loop system, right? The lower fractional transformation for the state feedback control. The only thing I would mention here, uh, and it's, uh, you, it's easy to miss, um, is this squared term here, right? So it's, it's somewhat important. 
right? In that the variable, if the variable is gamma, then this is not linear in gamma. Not linear in gamma. So what do we do about that? Well, okay, we, we got to create a new variable. Um, let's call it uh, a delta. No, delta is bad. Um, all right, we'll call it delta, but whatever. Beta, let's call it beta. Beta, which is gamma squared, right? And then we can, uh, we can replace this with beta, replace this with beta squared. And we'll take the square root of, uh, uh, sorry, this is square root of beta. Square root of beta. We'll take the square of both of these terms and we'll get squared here. And that's less than beta. Right. So that the uh, when you solve this LMI in beta, or gamma, whichever you prefer, you're actually not minimizing the H2 norm exactly. You're minimizing the square of the H2 norm. Now that's equivalent, right? The minimizing the square of something and minimizing it are equivalent. Uh, however, when we come back to mixing this with the H infinity norm, it's a bit of a headache uh, because we'll be minimizing the square of the H2 norm and we'll be minimizing uh, a ga the, the H infinity norm directly. So it's when we do the mixed optimal control problem, it's a bit of a bit of a hassle. But it's not that, not a hassle yet because we can we can now solve the full state feedback. Right solution to this full state feedback for uh, H2. So we have another LMI, another useful LMI for H2. Very good. All right, so we can solve the full state feedback problem for H2 optimal control. Great. Um, so what's the interpretation? Well, as we mentioned, one interpretation is uh, to minimize the effect of white noise on the system. However, there's another interpretation which is rather important and which I've hinted at earlier, uh, which we should go through as well. Because remember, maybe uh, you're not interested in minimizing white noise. Okay, so that's, that's entirely reasonable. Uh, let's, uh, let's instead of think of some interpretation in the time domain. So to present that interpretation, I'm going to briefly cover a topic which uh, is well known in the controls community, I guess, uh, which is the linear quadratic regulator problem. And actually, we covered this, I think it was in lecture two or something, something very early. Um, uh, but we, 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 we sort of breezed through it. It was in the context of optimization. Two? Maybe. Well, maybe it was three. I don't rem remember precisely. In any case, uh, it was an optimization problem. So we're minimizing, what are we minimizing? An objective function. What is that objective function? Well, it's this. Um, it's the square, it's the integral of the square of the state over time uh, with a weighting factor, a quadratic weight. And so it's a positive matrix. Uh, it's a weight depending on which states you want to minimize. Uh, and also we include here uh, a weight on the square of the input, the actuator signal. Uh, the weight is, is R, right? R is also greater than zero, right? And uh, that's, so the, the combination of these two is to minimize the size of the state and the size of the actuator signal. So actuator energy. Remember, Ray, we discussed this in lecture eight uh, when we talked about the optimal control framework, you always want to include uh, the actuator energy in your optimization problem, in your optimal control problem. Now, what, what do you choose as the weights, relative weights of Q of R? Uh, I argued in disputation, at least, that, uh, you know, R is like typically chosen to be uh, 0.1 to 0.5 of Q. So if you just chose Q equals to identity matrix, weight all, all, all input states equally, then you might choose R to be like 0.5 identity, if you like. It's, it's just a choice, right? It's up to you. So that's the, that's the objective function. Uh, so technically, uh, back in lecture two or three or whatever, 
we, what are the variables, right? Well, one of them we said could be x of t, u of t, and, uh, and maybe k as well, right? But of course, x of t and u of t are, are very highly constrained. Uh, for, in particular, for example, u of t uh, is constrained to, have, to be a, a simple static gain on the, on the states, right? So really, uh, we can like eliminate u of t as a variable because that's what this equation does. Uh, moreover, because we're given an initial condition, and the LQR problem is normally formulated at least in the, as an initial condition problem, uh, because otherwise everything is zero, right? If there's no initial condition, right, just set u equal to zero, there's no state, no input, so the answer is zero, right? So there has to be an initial condition. right, for the solution not to be zero. Right. It turns out the solution is the same for any initial condition. It doesn't matter what your initial condition actually is, but you need to have one. It can be non-zero, right? In the input-output framework, we always take the initial condition to be zero because otherwise uh, the framework doesn't really make sense. In the LQR problem, however, uh, we typically take it to be zero. Now, there's no real outputs and inputs. There's no exogenous inputs and there's no regulated outputs per se in this system. Although you can think of this objective function as sort of a weighted L2 norm of the states and the output, right? So you can think of this, right, as a weighted L2 norm of the state plus a weighted L2 norm of the, uh, of the, the U, right, with weights given by Q and R, right? So in a sense, actually, it seems like this actually has a lot more to do with the, uh, the H infinity problem, right? Because you're minimizing the L2 norm of the output. So is it, does that make this an H infinity problem? Um, well, no. And the reason is, of course, because there's no exogenous input. We're not minimizing the effect of exogenous inputs on the system. We're minimizing the effect of the initial condition on the system. And so it's not in the H input output framework per se. And it, you wouldn't think that that would make a huge difference. Um, but it turns out it completely changes the problem, right? It completely changes. Uh, the, uh, the, the mathematical formulation. So it turns out it's not an H infinity problem at all. It turns out it's an H2 problem, right? So, okay, let's like put this in the, uh, in the, uh, the optimal control framework as best we can, right? So as we, uh, so remember the objective, right, was uh, to minimize this uh, X of T, Q, X of T plus U of T, uh, R U of T, right? And uh, and so it seems like, right, that uh, uh, you know this is if if we set C one to be Q I Q one half, right? So the square root of Q, right? Q equals Q one half, Q one half, right? It's a positive matrix has a square root, right? And set this to be take its square root, r1 half, r1 half, right? Um, well, you could, right, you can, you can sort of formulate this and then you plug in u equals kx of t, right? Uh, if we look at the, uh, if we look at the L2 norm of the output, right, if we think of this as, uh, well, an L2 norm, um, so what is the L2 norm of? So if we let y equals um, uh, q1 half uh, and then uh, x of t um, plus uh, r1 half k x of t, right? If we let that be the output signal, well, then the square norm of that output signal, right, if we take then y squared, right, is just uh, just the objective function, right? It's as a function of time. 
x uh, q x and forgive forgive my lack of transposes here i'm just like trying to do this quickly uh, x of t k r one half r one half k x of t right which is of course equal to x of t q x of t and because right of this u equals k x of t right this is plus u of t r u of t right so for integrating this right we get uh, of this output we, we choose this output then we get the l2 norm uh, uh, of that output which is equal to the objective function right so it, it stands to reason right that this is a this is a reasonable approach right that uh, a regulated output in this case right should be uh, precisely this, right? Exactly this. Right? So that comes down here. So let's uh, let's choose it to be that, right? Let's choose our regulated output to be q one half times the state, and then on the bottom r one half times k of the state. Right? So that's uh, that's reasonable. Um, of course, d one one is zero, right? So that that's going to go to zero. Uh, and now here's a here's come a little bit of a funky choice. Um, let's set well b two is is obviously b right because that's how the input affects the problem right so obviously uh, we want uh, um, so actually it's on the next slide I think right that's our um, our system right b one equals b uh, sorry b two equals b. Right, so that makes sense, right? Uh, but then B1, what is, so B1, remember, is the effect of the exogenous input. We don't have an exogenous input, right? So why would we make that B1 equal to identity? Um, so this is the no, only non-obvious choice. Right. So, okay. Oh, sorry. AC. But let's uh, let's just do it and and, and see what happens. Um, so let's solve the H two optimal control problem with uh, setting our weight on the exogenous input to be identity, and see if that translates to a solution to the LQR problem. All right. So let's uh, okay. So so assume we solve the problem. We found our K. Uh, find our K. And then let's apply that k to the LQR problem, so which is a different problem. I'll find the k for H2, and then apply it to LQR. Right. Remember, the H2 problem is minimizing the size of the transfer function. And here, we're really trying to minimize the L2 norm of the output. So how is this going to help us? Well, let's take a look. So if we apply that K now to the LQR problem, right? All we do is we plug in uh, K to the, to the LQR problem. We close the loop. We get uh, X dot equals A plus B K X, right? Which is, of course, right the, from, from the LQR problem. That's, that's that. Uh, we've gotten this, uh, this feedback controller, and we have an initial condition. So unlike right the uh, the H two problem uh, where we have an exogenous input and no initial condition, in the LQR framework, once we've closed the loop, right, we can actually solve explicitly for the the output of the system. We can solve it explicitly because right, it's just a state space system with an initial condition. So state space with initial condition, and therefore it has a solution which we found in lecture, I don't know, I forgot, five, four, something like that. So we have a closed form solution. And specifically, that closed form solution is, right, x of t equals e to the a t x naught, where ACL here is uh, a plus b k. And furthermore, we can find an explicit expression for the output, 
y of t equals uh, ccl. Um, oh, of course, we don't have an output yet, but that's we'll, we'll get, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Uh, e to the a c l t x naught. So now let's like look at uh, this uh, this solution, right? So look at the solution to the LQR problem, where the K, remember, comes from our H2 optimal control problem. Right? So we close the loop on this system. And now let's look at this objective function, this weight. And that was the objective for LQR. Let's see how it performs. Right? Well, we just plug in our solution here, right? Plug in our solution <coughs> for x, right? That's e to the a c l t x naught. And we actually have the solution, of course, for u as well. u of t equals um, k times the state, but we already know what the state is. That's e to the a c l uh, t x naught as well, right? So we can plug in both those numbers, right? And find this expression for that objective function, right? So this is the this is the bit from u, and this is the bit from um, from x. So uh, and then we have the initial condition here, but we can bring in the initial condition outside the integral if we like, but because it's a constant. Uh, so now, of course, remember we've chosen our um, our outputs, right? We chose y of t uh, equal to right. Uh, q one half uh, x of t and uh, r one half k x of t, right? Where this is of course just u of t, right? So that that's our output. Uh, so uh, when we and then of course when we when we plug that in here, uh, we get precisely that, right? Y of t. And of course, now what we're looking at, we're looking at here, is that uh, this is, uh, of course, the output of the H two uh, of the of the the optimal control problem, right? C L uh, e to the a C L uh, t um, x naught. Now. Um, and now, and now here we we do a little trick, right? Uh, so this is the uh, this is a square integral of that of that of that. Um, so this is a this is a square integral of, of y of t, the L two norm of y of t. So now we plug that in, and we do we do a little trick in that we uh, remember b one was identity, right? So we can just add it in without losing anything, right? And why did we do that? Why did we add B1 as identity? Because now, if we look at this thing here, so we pulled out the, uh, the initial condition. We pulled it outside the integral, right? So it doesn't, doesn't matter. So we look at just this thing here, right? That is, right, the integral of Right, the square of c e to the a t b dt. Oops, squared. Where, of course, right, we actually use ACL here and CCL here and BCL here. Right. So now, if you remember from part A, right, this. The L2 norm of this little function here is equal to right, the transfer function of that system. And the, 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 sorry, the H2 norm of the transfer function of that system, that four system. Well, D is zero, of course. So. Right? That was by Parseval's uh, equality, and it was in the proof for the LMI, which we gave at the end of part A. Right? And that, of course, right, is the 
H2 norm of the closed loop system because these are the, the closed loop system matrices. Right. And so we get then uh, also equal to, of course, the this observability Gramian, right, as well. Uh, so that means that the objective uh, of the LQR problem, the response of the LQR problem to initial condition x naught is equal to the size of the initial condition, which doesn't change, or well, like, it doesn't matter, times the H2 norm of that uh, closed loop uh, system, right? So the, that H2 norm. Right. So if we solve then the H2 optimal control problem, the state feedback H2 optimal control problem for that system that we described, right? For uh, on the previous slide, let's go back to it so I don't have to repeat myself. If we solve the H2 optimal control problem for this system, right? That's B1. This is a C uh, closed loop. This is a C closed loop or A closed loop. Then we get the, uh, we, we bound the, uh, we have, well, it's e it, they're equalities, right? Uh, that's precisely equal to the, um, the objective function in the LQR problem times the initial condition. So if we minimize the H2 norm of this sort of pseudo system, uh, that's going to minimize the, H, the, L, the LQR norm, if you will, uh, for the, 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 the state feedback problem. So that's a, it's interesting, and of course, it doesn't depend on the initial condition, so right, your solution won't depend on the initial condition. Right? So it's, it's, it's 1K, which works for every initial condition. So we get then that the LQR problem, even though it looks different and it looks like an L2 norm, actually turns out to be the H, H2 norm of the transfer function for a slightly modified problem. Right? And so we get that then the LQR problem is reduces to a special case of the H2 optimal control problem using uh, static state feedback, right? full state feedback. Right. So if you want to solve LQR, well, of course, there are other ways to solve LQR. Uh, you, but if you wanted to do it through H2, you could do so using the LMIs on the previous slide. And of course, it's more general because you can choose arbitrary uh, weightings on your outputs by different choices of, of, of this, this C, these C matrices here. Right. So you, you could change this to, to anything and you get sort of the same response. Uh, so if you just, so the, the key is to choose the initial, the, the input matrix B1 to B identity. And then uh, your H2 problem is minimizing the uh, response to initial conditions of the output. So um, thus H2 state feedback with B1 equals to identity uh, actually minimizes the L2 norm of the regulated output uh, where uh, uh, um, for uh, no exogenous input and any initial condition. So two interpretations of H2, optimal control. First, uh, minimizes the uh, size of uh, the response, the, the variance of the output with respect to white noise. And second, it minimizes, if you choose B8, I1 equal to identity, the size of the output in the L2 norm for, a get, for any initial condition. Okay. So two interpretations, very important. All right, so now we'll uh, stop again. And when we come back, we'll cover a few more uh, topics, uh, somewhat miscellaneous. First, uh, dynamic output feedback uh, for, uh, uh, for the H2 norm and mixed H to H infinity feedback for dynamic output feedback. And then we'll briefly cover the uh, common filter in continuous and discrete time and show that that's actually a special case of, uh, of our problem here. So I'll pause again.